Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Dr. Nasser Shake Show. I'm your guest host for today. My name is Dr. Nasser. And what's on tap for today? Well, we're continuing our reaction video series to the Daily Wire debate between Ben Shapiro and Anna Kasparian of the Young Turks. It's part eight of this debate. We're going to get to that in just the next few seconds. But before we do so, we just wanted to let you know, subscribe to our channel here at the Dr. Nasser Shake Show. Hit that notification bell, like, share, and follow us. And even more in particular, put your comments down below. Let us know what you think. Let's get to the video, part eight of the debate between Anna Kasparian and Ben Shapiro. The idea that the federal government is supposed to cram down on Amazon, that it, it has to pay people a certain wage, when there are other people who are willing to work for below that wage in the same exact town, like, how is that consensual? A consent seems to need to exist on both sides when it comes to labor relations. Yeah, look, the, the NLRB's main role is protecting workers who uh, might deal with their employer raining terror on them if they are organizing the workplace. You know, the retaliatory strategies that we've seen from companies like Starbucks have been pretty gross. We need to allow people to have those conversations, to organize their workplace without fear of retaliation from their employer, right? So that's the main reason why I think the NLRB is important. You know, the anecdote that you shared about, you know, what happened with you and the editorial control, that is insane. And, and look, we, I'm not going to name names, obviously, but we had a similar issue, not with the uh, union, but with employees who didn't like some of the commentary from me or some of the commentary from Jenk. That's called sad day for you. If you right. can't handle differences of opinion, then this is not the career path you should go in. That is free speech. And guess what? We're also workers. I'm a worker. I have my rights too. I should be able to speak my mind on the show that I produce and host. Um, but, you know, aside from that... I was just going to say something here, Anna. I mean, I'm just thinking out loud, you know, since you're on the side of the workers. What if there's some workers out there that, like you said, didn't like the way that, you know, you talked about a certain subject or didn't like you know, your policy stand. First of all, I don't know why they would be wanting to working over there in the first place, but maybe they need a job, so they got that position. But that's no different than anybody else coming in basically saying, but I know it's a free speech issue, but you can understand where they've got a diversity of thought, diversity of opinion. Why aren't you listening to them, right? But you would have perfect grounds if they continued that to fire that employee because they were making waves. They didn't like the fact the way that you talked about a subject. They didn't like the subject material. They're not involved in that aspect of the business. They're involved in digital marketing or editing or those kinds of things or whatever. But they certainly didn't like where the company was going or what you were talking about. So where do you draw the line here? If they start to become a malcontent, they start to um, do things that are pretty detrimental to the company. I'm sure Senk, Jenk, the big Uger would um, try to decide, you know, what's best for the company. And if needed, hey, you're gone, buddy. Hit the road, Jack. I just think that there is, there is a, an imbalance of power right now. And it's because of the fact that labor unions have been dismantled in this country. And workers need those collective bargaining rights in order to have a say, not just in what they're getting paid, but also their workplace conditions. I think the rail workers and what the <laughs> Democratic controlled Congress did to the rail workers was pretty gross. I don't know what you felt about that, but rail workers deserve to be able to take a day off or more than just a day off if they're sick or if they have a family emergency without being penalized by their employer. And the fact that, you know, during these labor negotiations, they couldn't even secure that. And you had the Biden administration literally put its thumb on, not literally, but put its thumb yeah. on the scale to prevent them from striking, I, I disagree with entirely. So, I mean, uh, on principle, I'm, I'm not in favor of unions being able to bargain for more than they can get. When it comes to the the internal turmoil of the Democratic Party having problems with the labor unions that it seeks to appease, I, I admit that I enjoyed it. But, it, but I mean, but it shows you, but that's the thing, Ben, like it's really important to, to differentiate between the principled left, right? I'm not just saying leftist, right. the principled left, those who actually want to empower labor, and then the Democrats who pay lip service to labor unions. And that is why you are seeing 
working people start to realign their political ideology, unfortunately, in some cases with the right, because they will hear someone like Trump pay lip service to workers, even though the talk is cheap. He didn't actually follow through with a lot of what he said, but just acknowledging those issues. He followed through with a lot that he said, Anna, a lot that he said. Couldn't, not everything, but you know what? He only had four freaking years, should have had four freaking more, but we know what happened over there, don't we? But don't say that he didn't do what he promised. There was a lot of things that he did that he promised. In, uh, average income, okay, for families, $5,000 more during Trump. Employment for every demographic was up. Blacks, Latinos, Hispanics, Asians, women, um, uh, you know, um, high school educated. It was up. During, during Obama's time, it was $1,000 for families, $400 during Bush, $5,000. In some instances, it was more. The tax cuts were phenomenal for the... They say, oh, only the rich got the tax cuts. No, it was for 80% of the population. A lot of those 80 percenters were middle America. ...that workers have been dealing with made Trump super appealing to them. Well, I think in, in the future, one of the places where there will actually be bipartisan agreement is... I, I think indirectly it will have serious effects on labor, but the, the sort of willingness now to face up to the threat that China represents is going to have some pretty dramatic impact on, on reshaping supply chains, on reshaping how manufacturing and labor work, uh, particularly in the United States. I think a lot of the outsourcing that has gone to China is going to be reshored in fairly short order, given, given the fact that both parties are now realizing what a threat China represents. Well, look, and aside from China being an adversary and all of that, and I'm a little uneasy with some of the rhetoric that I'm seeing, and it's, it seems like an area where Democrats and Republicans are united, the rhetoric, I don't want it to lead toward an actual like war with China. And I feel like Biden has been irresponsible with some of the things he said, like, oh, you know, if China invades Taiwan, we'll have boots on the ground. Don't say stuff like that. That's incredibly stupid. But in terms of like the manufacturing issues, the supply chain issues, I'm very happy to see that politicians are finally waking up to the fact that we need to manufacture things in the United States. I mean, this is one of the failures of, you know, Venezuela's policies. They stopped manufacturing things, started importing everything. And uh, once oil prices went down, and oil, of course, is like their number one uh, commodity and export, they were screwed, right? So we experienced how insanely fragile our... They were also screwed because of the policies that they had when they nationalized everything. That's the thing. Socialism nationalized everything, basically, you're getting screwed, no Vaseline, no cover, no anything. Supply chains are, we need to manufacture jobs here in the United States, or manufacture products and bring jobs back here to the United States. I like that we're headed in that direction to some extent. The CHIPS Act is a good example of that. Um, so we'll see. We'll see what happens. I think there's certain specified industries. Chips are, are obviously one of them. Right. Where, where, where they actually implicate national security. And so you are going to see some right-left yes. coalitions that are sort of odd uh, when it comes to reshoring that sort of stuff. Same with pharmaceutical drugs, by the way. That's true. Yep. Uh, any uh, stuff that has been manufactured in China heretofore and that seriously impacts national security is going to be reshored. Much of it's not going to be reshored in the United States, by the way. A lot of it's going to end up in Vietnam. Some of it's going to end up in Thailand. You're, you're gonna, Mexico. You're gonna, uh, Thailand, yeah, Mexico. You're, you're going to see a lot of this stuff go to other places on the globe. And, you know, to the, the sort of countervailing point to, to the we need to reshore everything is that autarky has essentially been a giant failed economic strategy wherever it's been tried. The idea of all manufacturing happens in our country. All products must be produced from within. That, that, that generates economic failure. I mean, one of the reasons that Venezuela has failed is specifically because it is essentially economically isolated and self-isolated. I mean, they nationalized virtually all of their industry and they prevented people from being able to own even within their country. I mean, there's foreign direct investment basically dried up. There was no money going into Venezuela. I mean, the, the, one of the, 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 there's half of the story that's been told when it comes to the American economy about stagnating wages. The other half that has not been told is that what you get for your wages now is way better than what you got in 1980. I mean, that, that, that is just a reality. You would not wish well, to live I, in 1980 that's, that's, as opposed to now. You, you, you now have a no, refrigerator, you have a microwave, you have two cars, you have a... Sure, okay, so if you want to talk about the uh, technological advances... Well, I mean, the stuff that... Sure, if you want to talk about the fact that you've got a couple of cars and a dog and a cat and a mouse and a rat 
and you know you've got um, a microwave and you know flat screen TVs. Sure, if you want to talk about that, I mean, you know, I mean, that's what Anna's saying, right? Would you rather have the wages in 1980? Or would you rather have your wages right now? Would you rather have the things that you have right now, the things you had in 1980? Come on, this is unbelievable. Sure, the stuff that you have for your sure. money. Aside from two specifically government subsidized areas, healthcare and education. There's a lot of crap. Okay, so look, honestly, would you, would been, you rather live in 1980? Like that that standard of living? In terms of the quality of products that Americans could buy, I want to go back to the 1950s. Okay, I'm literally. He I was right there. They still driving those cars. I stopped. I completely stopped buying new clothes. Everything I buy now is vintage, made by American garment workers in the 1950s. And those garments, by the way, look like they're brand new. Brand new quality. Like what we did. But the percentage in, of salary that you would have to spend on that is much that's higher. True, that's true. That's true. So we. So for the worker, that's you're true. not shopping vintage shops from the 50s. No, no, you're going no. H&M. So okay. So but understand. So what what happened with uh, especially this this is what happened in the 1970s. We started offshoring jobs and really focused on consumerism. Right. So wages started to become stagnant. But Americans were okay because they can rely on cheap products that are made in other countries through exploited labor, right? So we have a bunch of cheap crap we can buy, sure. But the quality of the stuff we're buying is not there. We have to replace it after. I mean, look at clothing in particular. You buy clothes in America that, by the way, were made in some other country, in some factory or whatever. You wash it, falls apart the next day. I mean, that's true, but the percentage of your salary every year that you're spending on clothing is way lower than it was in 1980. And when, when you talk about sort of the economic narrative yeah. of the 70s, there's a countervailing point of view, which is that heavy unionization, high labor costs in the 50s and 60s, and a time where literally the rest of the world was physically destroyed by World War II, gave us a head start, which we then blew over the course of the next two decades, to the point by the 1970s, we have a decade of economic stagnation with literally no stock growth from essentially... 1963 all the way up till the, the early to mid-1980s. You have 20 years where your stocks don't actually appreciate in any serious way because the economy basically stops dead. We're getting outcompeted. The American car companies, which are the crown jewel of American industry, mm -hmm. are getting outcompeted by Toyota mm -hmm. and Hyundai. And by the 1970s, 1980s, we're importing all of those cars. That's not because we offshored to them. It's because we didn't offshore them. It's because no, we they were, totally they were... did offshore. Not maybe not to Asian countries. We offshored a lot. I mean, think about the Rust Belt, right? And and all the manufacturing jobs that went. The to offshoring Mexico. happened later. That, that, that offshoring right. happened in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Correct. That was yeah. as a, that was an aspect of attempting to compete with the import of cars mm. from other countries. I mean, Toyota becomes a world power in terms of being an actual global corporation because our manufacturing costs in the United States are too high. We're living fat and happy off the excesses of the rest of the world being destroyed, essentially. And because of that, we could afford to do all this. We were the only game in town. Mm. And then we weren't the only game in town. Suddenly, Japan rises from the ashes and is an economic world power and mm -hmm. is outproducing us when it comes to cars. And so you have two choices at that point. Either you go tariff Right, you actually start restricting imports mm -hmm. and you generate enormous costs for your own citizens who are now having to spend more money. Right. Or you have to or you have to start offshoring and competing and lowering the wages. And so that's essentially what happened. In the I 70s. would I would go on the tariff route for sure. So the, the, right. So I mean, this, and then by the way, so so Trump, right? I mean, this is sort of that right left horseshoe that, that's been happening. Obviously, I wouldn't because if, if you just again, I will go back to my original point. I don't think that you'd be willing to have many takers who would be willing to go back to 1980s level standard of living. Yeah. From 2022, we have we have a, a for as much as we can talk about the excesses of Amazon, we now live in a world in which you can take a device out of your pocket, you can hit a button, and any product on earth will arrive at your door in two days. That's true. And look, that's part of consumerism, and it would certainly be a culture shock for Americans to like rethink whether or not they need all of this stuff that's made in other countries. So that's the honest trade-off. Yeah. And I appreciate the is, honest trade-off. No, and I, and I am being honest. And look, I... I I, I acknowledge that people might not agree with me. Most people might not agree with me. But for me, I, in my personal life, have become a lot more happy in rejecting that consumerist mentality. When I spend my money, I spend on quality items that are going to last. And I just feel better about my purchases knowing that it was made, at least at a time, when people were, were I mean, unionized, so when they were actually making living wages, they were succeeding, they were able to buy homes for themselves and their families. I want to go back to that. 
The fact that most Americans now are not able to buy a home in America is insane. We need to figure out what it is that we, what it is that's leading to this. Well, we know why we have this inequality, what we can do to lessen that economic inequality, because we want more Americans to actually enjoy that slice of the once American dream. I mean, I think we certainly agree on enjoying the slice of American dream. How we get there is another question. Yeah. And when it comes to housing, I will mention that apartments are way bigger than they were in 1980. Houses are way, way bigger than they, they were are. Yep. In, in 1980. You know, the, the, the real question, I think, and, and this is you know, an open question, I think one that, that people are going to have to decide, is when it comes to inequality, you can, you can essentially, democratic socialism, which you're an advocate for, I, redistributes things that are already there. Capitalism generates new and better things. And so the balance has always been how much can you continue to generate new and better things when you are redistributing what's already there? Well, you're not taking into account the financialization of our economy, right, which is completely disconnected from productivity. So what I mean by that is we're now in this age where companies don't even really need to focus on productivity when they can do things like corporate stock buybacks, so, uh, by the way, I agree with a lot of that, yeah. and, and one of the things that has generated that is, is the Fed. Is the, Fed. <laughs> yeah. the Fed is a disaster yep. area. Totally the, agree the, on that. The, the massive infusion. I agree with that as well. The Fed is an absolute freaking joke. The Fed has done so many things to ruin the economy. It, it's never been audited. I mean, it's just one of those things that nobody wants to, you know, tackle the Fed. Nobody wants to basically say, you know what, let's limit the powers of the Fed. These guys have whoever's been put in charge of that, but these are the big bankers, these are the big financial institutions, and they're obviously doing things that are going to benefit them. And in the meantime, while they do that, it absolutely crushes, crushes the individual. So I completely agree with Anna and uh, Ben on this aspect of what they're talking about, the Fed and its excesses and how it's completely damaged and ruined economies here in the United States and across the globe. Because when you... When the American economy falls, when there's a recession, when things happen here, the domino effects are felt around the world, folks. Of tremendous amounts of money and easy credit into the system Definitely. has led to people doing exactly that. You, you, you are 100% right about that. That is true. And we're also seeing that happen within the housing market where you have private equity firms who have taken interest-free money, cheap money, <laughs> thanks to the Federal Reserve, they're just buying up entire neighborhoods of single-family homes that typically would be purchased by actual families. Again, agree. The, Fe yeah. the Federal Reserve is expending extraordinary resources, and ha their, their easy money policies over the course of the last two decades have been an absolute disaster Definitely. for the American economy. And quantitative easing, honestly, started under the Obama administration. So the fury that middle America feels toward Democrats like Obama, I get it. Because after you just got foreclosed on, after all of that heartache that your family experienced in the 2008 economic crash, you see the banks, you see Wall Street, you see the same individuals literally exploit that crisis to become even wealthier. Right, and, but, uh, and, and here's where I think this has always been sort of the, the fascinating divide when it came to, for example, the Tea Party and Occupy Wall Street. So my, my question always with Occupy Wall Street, which is making some of the same points you're making, is why are you occupying Wall Street? Why aren't you occupying K Street? Like, you, you should be in Washington. I don't understand why you're going after... The people, again, speaking of incentive structures, the people in Wall Street are acting based on an incentive structure. Mm -hmm. That incentive structure is created by the easy money, which is actually being generated by the Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve. Why? One of those things is a thing where you have stock in it. It's called your vote. And one of those things is a place you do not have stock in it, and that's called Wall Street, unless you actually have stock in the company, in which case you go to the shareholder meeting. So it seems to me that the focus should be placed on the origin of the public policy. If you and I can agree mm. that the Federal Reserve should stop pumping money into the economy, and this will naturally lower the amount of easy money that is available for all of these places to buy up all of the single family homes in Houston, for example, mm -hmm. then I think we actually hit agreement. I think where we hit the disagreement is where you say, okay, we need to penalize these companies for buying up the single family homes. No. And I, I really don't think that that's really the issue. Well, no, we need to do away with the ability for them to get that easy money and buy up the single family homes. And honestly, one of the biggest issues, I think part of the reason why, or the main reason why the Obama administration went along with this whole quantitative easing policy is because whether you're talking about Democrats or Republicans, both parties have been captured by those corporate interests thanks to unlimited campaign donations and to political action committees, thanks to the fact that our politicians can be personally invested in individual stocks. 
we need to reform the system. It's not necessarily about punishing Wall Street. It's about getting to the root of the problem, which is the corrupt influence that Wall Street has on our politicians, thanks to how this system is set. I mean, I don't disagree with any of that particularly, yeah. but I would say that there, there's one additional element that I actually think looms far larger, and that is the political interest in Washington is always going to be in control, and Keynesian economics suggests that the easiest way to avoid blowback for a stagnating economy is to pump money into it. Hmm. And so if you are in Washington, you're never going to be the president who says, we need to radically increase the interest rates. Right? The interest rates are not meeting with what the actual risk level is in American society. Right now, Biden's taking the heat for it. The reality is that the interest, the notion that the Federal Reserve, every president is going to have an interest in pumping money into the system. The more money you pump into the system, the more you inflate the GDP. The more you inflate the GDP, the more people have the impression that things are going splendidly. True. The more easy money there is in the system, the more that you do have corporate interests or backing. All of that's true. But that starts with the amount of control that can be exercised by Washington, which is why, you know, and this is where we'll disagree, I think that Washington should be stripped and castrated and, and, and <laughs> most of its power should be taken away. And then we don't have to worry about any of this. And all the stuff you want to do at the local level, you can do with your friends. And what I don't want to do the local level I can do with my friends. Anna, thank you so much for stopping. That was classic. Absolutely. You know, castrate Washington, D.C. Perfect. Basically, you know, castrate the policies, castrate it at the federal, you know, you know, at the Fed level. Because what Ben was basically saying is is, is correct, is, is that quantitative, quantitative easing, Keynesian economics, putting that money out into the system, that's what they're going to do. That's what the power brokers are going to do. That's what the policy is going to be able to do. That's where the financial institutions are going to draw their power from, their leverage from. That's what's going to happen. No one's going to ever come out there and basically say, you know, we need to stop pumping. It's just not going to happen. And there's just too much power, too much influence, too much, you know, excess that's going on, which in the corridors of Washington power brokers and the financial institutions and the corporations and the money that's, you know, we're talking trillions and trillions of dollars. And then remember, you're just not talking from the issuance of the United States of America, but you're also talking about the big financial institutions and the global institutions around the world as well that have a say in this. And they're looking at it from the fact of is that how can they make the most money? What can they do to stimulate the economy using whatever procedures and things, policies that they've done in the past? And to continue to pump that easy money into the fund. They love it. If someone's saying, hey, here's a million dollars, you know, go ahead and take it. And it's interest free. Well, what are you going to do? You're going to take that money. And then what are you going to do it? Invest it, buy up things, do whatever you need to do. But at some point in time, someone's going to have to pay the bank. And unfortunately, what's happening right now, it's middle America and the middle class that's basically getting the short end of the stick. Anyways, we appreciate you taking the time to uh, watch. You've been watching the Dr. Nasser Shake Show. I've been your guest host. My name is Dr. Nasser. Love you to subscribe to our channel. Hit that notification bell. Like, share, and follow us. Comment below. Let us know what you think. And I'll leave with my final thought, which is, when you're right, you're right. And when you're left, you're wrong. See you again next time, folks. Take care and stay safe.